You ever have bad counsel? Maybe you've had good counsel, but you ever had bad advice, good advice? LeBron James got bad advice when he did that whole thing on the decision. I don't know if you remember that. A friend of his from high school said, ah, this is all the, ought to be the way you're going to announce you're going to go to Miami Heat. Not a good call. Or maybe before 2008, you were talked into getting in, in, to invest in real estate. Said, man, it's a great time to jump into real estate. But what they didn't tell you is that you need to know something about rehabbing or mortgage financing or landlording, and then the, the bottom fell out of the market. There's a story in the Bible about good advice and bad advice. There's a, a king named Rehoboam. His father was Solomon, and Solomon was a great builder. A lot of what you see in Israel is Solomon got to start a lot of cities. The first temple was built by Solomon. But in order to be able to get that stuff done, he had to tax the people pretty heavily. Well, when he died and his son Rehoboam took over, some people came to Rehoboam and said, listen, it has been a heavy season of tax. Why don't you give us a break? Let us catch your breath. And so he went to his father's advisors and he asked them, what do you think? And they said, man, that's a great way to endear yourself to the people. Yeah, why don't you give people a break? They'll love you for it. They're a great way to start your reign. But then he went to his friends that he grew up with and he said, what do you think I should do? And they said to him, you need to stick it to them. You need to let them know you're boss, man. You need to say, you think my dad was tough? Wait till you see me. And that's the way he chose to go. He listened to the voices of his young friends. And then he lost 80% of his kingdom as a result. Tonight, we're going to talk about what does it mean to seek good counsel? What does it mean to seek good advice? Let's pray. Father God, for the next few moments, we would ask that our hearts and minds would be in tune to hear from you Fill us with your spirit, for your spirit is our teacher, our convictor, our encourager, the one who makes much of Jesus. Father, I pray those things that are from me and not from you would quickly be forgotten, for I will only tend to confuse. But the clarity comes is when I say your words after you, that's where the hope is. We remind ourselves of Isaiah where it says, your word never returns to you a void without you accomplishing your agenda. We, hear, we believe that again here tonight. But we also pray, like James, that we not be merely hearers of your word, but that we would also be doers of your word, putting this into practice, thinking differently and living differently. Now, with our heads bowed, let me give you a moment to pray. And maybe your prayer is simply this tonight. Father God, teach me to be blessed by seeking your counsel. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Page 448, Psalm 1. Let's take a look at the first verse. Blessed is the man who walks in the counsel, but blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. Now let me pause there. That phrase, blessed is the man, really could be the theme for the whole book of Psalms. Remember we talked about that Psalms, the book of Psalms, are made up of 150 Psalms. And the theme that you can read through as you go through Psalms, this whole idea is blessed is the man. Blessed is the woman. When we think about the Psalms, what we see in the Psalms, what the Psalms teach us is that it talks about both positive and negative pursuit of God. It talks about our inward and our outward thoughts and our pursuit and our actions of God. It speaks figuratively and literally. It talks about those who seek God and those who don't seek God. Now look down again with me. Blessed is the man or woman. Now what does that word blessed mean then? It means to know the favor of God. If you are blessed, it means that you know the favor and understand the favor of God in your life. It means also, then, if you are a blessed man, that you are not seeking the counsel of those who walk, stand, and sit with the wicked or sinners and scoffers. Now, if you look at the progression, it goes from the casual to the more intimate in those three words. But it really, poetically, it's talking about that we're not seeking counsel on how to live a blessed life from those who don't know God. They have no relationship with God. Let's just look at the word wicked for a moment. It's such a strong word, isn't it? Wicked. What does it mean? Biblically, what does it mean? It describes people who are practical atheists. If someone is spiritually wicked, they are a practical atheist. They live as if there is no God. They make decisions as if there is no God, and they are not interested in the counsel of God. 
In Psalm 10, another psalm, it says this. We'll put it up here on the screen. In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek God. All his thoughts are, there is no God. One Jewish writer put it this way. The spiritually wicked are always looking but are never satisfied because they're not looking and pursuing the right thing. Look at verse 2 then. In contrast to this, what does the blessed person do? But in contrast, the blessed man or woman delights in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Now, what does it mean to delight? It means to have extreme pleasure. It means those things that we find great joy, enjoyment in. Now, you probably have a list of things you find pleasure in. I have a list. When I go visit my grandchildren, Don and I go visit our grandchildren, one of the things I delight in is in the morning, early in the morning, my grandson runs in like a tornado, and he says, all right, Grandpa, let's go donut picking. And my heart just fills up to be able to go and spend those moments with him. I'm an early riser, so watching the sun come up over Lake Michigan brings me great delight. The Cubs, when they're on a winning streak, unlike today, brings me great delight. The affectionate caress of my wife. Watching the spiritual light go on for somebody. These are all things that I find great delight in. What does it mean then when we find great delight in God, that we find great delight in his law, that we have that same joy, that same level of excitement, that same sense of this is important to us, Now, what is law? Because, again, that's one of those strong words for us. It's interesting when you look at Jewish scholars around this idea of law that they translate this a little bit differently than we do in our Christian Bibles. It comes from the Hebrew word Torah, but they have a broader sense of it than we do. They see it as instruction, as teaching, God's guidance for how we should live, that the law is God's guidance for how we should live, live in relationship with him and live in relationship with each other. As followers of Christ, we should delight in this law, this instruction, this guidance that God gives us. And last week, our elders did a great job of reminding us out of Psalm 23 that as God is our great shepherd and we see the manifestation of that shepherding in the person of Jesus, that we are protected, we are guided, we are provided for him when we live under his hand and live within the guidelines of his law. When I lived in Philadelphia for those many years, let me show you the house that we lived in. It's a little bit different because we had a bunch of trees there in the Owner, owner now has cut down all the trees. But we had a half acre, and we had a dog. We had a golden retriever named Dakota. We loved this dog. It was like part of the family. And because we loved this dog and wanted to protect this dog, we put an invisible fence around our yard. Now, maybe you don't know what a visible fence is. It's a wire that runs all the way around your property. And the dog wears a collar. And so around this collar, Dakota had this this, uh, little instrument that when he got too close to this wire, which was maybe two feet from the street, it would begin to beep to warn him, you're getting too close to the street, back up. And then if we, what's called bolting, if you ran across this wire, it would give him a little bit of a shock, you know, just enough to kind of say, you don't want to be doing that. Now, why do we do that? Because we want him to know that in the yard, here, back in the yard, this is where you're loved. This is where you're cared for. This is where you're protected. This is where the relationship is. Right here. Stay in here. God's law is an invisible fence for us where God says, live in here. This is where you can know me. This is where you can enjoy me. This is for your protection. God is not the cosmic killjoy. He says, I put this here for your safety. Now our dog would sit at the top of that hill, if you keep that picture up for me, would sit at the top of our driveway, which is steeper than it looks on here. And he would sit there and he would look out. And after a while, we began to recognize that he would look out and it's like, what's out there that I don't have? There's got to be something else out there. And you could see him begin to contemplate the wheel spinning of what should I do about this? Then almost like a cartoon character, he'd begin to spin his back legs and he'd run down this hill and out into the street and you'd hear it, beep, beep, beep. And then you'd hear this, oh, and then off he would go. And we would chase after him because we love him. But he was so fast that we'd take off and we couldn't find him. And eventually, he would make his way back and he would sit at the end of the driveway. He's not going to come back in and get shocked again. So he sits at the end of the driveway. And our dog didn't bark. What he did, he howled. 
And he would howl to let you know, I'm home. You know, some of us live our lives just like that. God says, listen, in the law right here, here's all the things to enjoy. I've created you. I know what's good for you right here. It's in the yard. Stay in the yard. But we are convinced that it's out there. There's something out there. God's withholding from me. There's something better out there. That's where I need to be. And we run down that driveway and we run out into the world. And then we find out it's not as good as we thought. It's not what we wanted. And we limp home. And we sit at the end of the driveway and we say, God, I'm home. God's law is good. God's law is beneficial. God's law is instructive. God's law is helpful. God's law describes for us what it means to live in the yard with God. Psalm 1611, we'll put it up here. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are the pleasures forevermore. That is living in the yard. 1 John 5, 3 in the New Testament says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. When we live in the yard, there is no weight, because we know this is where the joy and the satisfaction of our relationship with God. Here's the safety. But for some of us, we don't see the delight of the law. We find it to be burdensome. But may I suggest the reason we find it burdensome is because we don't want to obey. That we've run down the driveway because we're convinced it's better on the other side. As soon as we step out, then we feel the weight of the law, the conviction of the law. But we feel it in our disobedience. Look down with me again at verse 2 the blessed man or woman, and on his law, he or she meditates day and night. Meditates. Figuratively speaking, communicating always. We ponder this all day long. Meditate means to ruminate, thoughtful consideration that is taking place. You also get this idea of chewing cud from this idea of we meditate. Like a cow chews cud all day long. In fact, we have a saying where this would come from. Why don't you give me some time to chew on that? That's where this idea comes from. We meditate, we process, we think about it. It's in our meditating that we see the richness of God's law. God has given us all of the Scripture, all of his Scripture, and we meditate and we think on it, we ponder it, we chew on it, and that's where we see the richness of it, the depth of it. That's where we find the joy. That's where we understand the application is in that processing and that mediating, meditating. Now, let me ask you, in your quiet moments, what do you meditate on? In your quiet moments, what do you meditate on? Thoughts of success? Thoughts of revenge? Sexual thoughts? Thoughts of things that you must have, things that you must conquer? Where does our mind go when we're quiet? If it's not going to think about the things of God and God's Word, where does our mind go? We meditate on God's Word. We think about it. We wrestle, and we begin to understand how it applies to our life. For God's law answers the issues of our lives. How do I love an unloving spouse? How do I love a rebellious child? How do I love a difficult roommate? How do I engage with a harsh boss? How do I live patiently with infertility? How do I find victory over pornography, over eating, over spending? How do I work through being a people pleaser? How do I process anxiety and depression? How do I find God in investing my life in the kingdom? How do I seek God and make God first? All important issues. All important questions. And God answers the, the questions that we have. And we understand the answers when we take time to reflect and to process, to meditate. Let's just look at one. Let's back up and look at how do I work through being a people pleaser? Many of us are people pleasers in here. We're people pleasers who are looking for others to affirm us, to fulfill us, to satisfy us, to tell us we're awesome, way to go. We are emotional holics, and we need the word of others to satisfy our soul. What we're really saying is that we need them to be our Savior. We need the words of others to be our Savior. We need their approval to find our value. We need their affirmation to know who we really are. 
Now, it'd be easy for us to come along to each other and just go, well, don't worry about what anybody says about you, because that's impossible. And frankly, it's not healthy, because people may say things to us that we need to hear. We need to hear those words. They may say things that are truthful and that we need to process, but also not to care at all. Our hearts begin to get hardened, and we may lose our ability to be compassionate. And as followers of Christ, we are called to live with compassionate hearts. When we listen to the counsel of God, and we think about what God has to say, and we meditate on God's Word, we begin to get our thinking right around this issue. Let me show you two verses. Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man lays a snare. When we have a fear of people issues, it's a snare for us, a trap, because then we seek their approval. But whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. 1 Thessalonians 2, 4, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. It is the gospel that we dwell on. It is God that we think about. It's who he is and what he has done. That's where we find our identity. That's where we find our hope that Jesus loves us and died for us in spite of who we are and what we've done, that people's opinions of us will change, but God's opinion of us and what God has done for us will not change. His love for us is based on the death and resurrection of his son. It is based on his unchanging character, not ours. We can trust him in what he says and what he has done for us. How do we delight in the law? How do we find ways to delight in the law? Well, first, we read. We need to have a regular pattern of reading, a daily pattern of reading. Maybe this summer, if you're not currently reading something, you jump in and read the Psalms with us. Just read a Psalm a day. Some are short, some are longer. Maybe you take two days. Or if you don't want to read the Psalms, we're going to study through the Gospel of Mark this fall. Maybe you read through the Gospel of Mark, 16 chapters written from Peter, who was Jesus' best friend, from his sermons that a guy named John Mark took down and put together. And so you read the, these eyewitness accounts of the life of Jesus and, and get prepared for, and get ready for this fall. But whatever you're reading, it's important the way we meditate is we ask questions of what we read. Here are three questions that you can ask. We'll put them up here. What's this passage saying about God or about Jesus? What's this passage saying about our human condition, meaning what's it say about fear or hope or love or whatever situation it might be? And what's this passage asking me to think or do? What's the exhortational aspect? What am I being asked to think or do? Now, what's going to happen as you read? You're going to come across things you don't understand. I read and come across things that I don't understand. And sometimes you need somebody else to kind of get you started in how to think this thing. So let me suggest some tools and we'll put them up here as well. A good study Bible is a good place to start. The ESV study Bible is the one I prefer. It's as big as a brick, but it is a great study Bible. Now, I just remind you that the study notes are not inspired. Those are what people think, but they do a good job, and most times they do a good job of kind of getting you started to understand the passage. Or here's any number of websites that you can go on and ask questions or pursue, or they have commentaries or Bible dictionaries, and you go on and kind of begin to figure out and understand some of the questions you might have. One of our pastors recommended this NIV Compact Commentary, and the gentleman is an Old Testament scholar. I've read several of his things, a very, very bright man that would be incredibly helpful for you to be able to have. To meditate then, for us to meditate as we delight in the law and we read it and then we meditate, meditate implies that it's going to be quiet, that you're going to have moments of quiet. That means you take out the earplugs, you turn off the music, you turn off the TV or whatever, and you enjoy the quiet because it's in the quiet that you're able to engage with your God. And we don't like quiet. We are not in a culture that likes quiet. We like busy. We like noise. But to meditate is to be quiet and to be, asked to be able to ask your questions and to listen as you process over the Scripture and the Spirit of God teaches you through your study. Maybe you need to sit down and journal. I'm a journaler, I think. It helps me process to write things out. 
or I process by walking. That helps helpful for me. That might be helpful for you or for some of you. No, you need to sit still and to sit quiet and to be able to think. You know yourselves. What do you need? Maybe it's an accountability partner. Maybe it's somebody that you just touch base with every day and kind of going, all right, what did you think about today? What did you process? What did you meditate about in God's Word? And here's what I was wrestling with. Here's what I was thinking. The important thing is that we fully engage, we delight, and we meditate in God's Word. It comes down to whose counsel will we seek. A blessed man seeks the counsel of God through his law. He doesn't seek those who don't know God to help him know God and to grow in his relationship with God. He seeks out God and God's words to know God. Where we turn for counsel tells us what we trust. Who you go to for counsel about life and life situations will tell you who you and what you trust. We each need good counsel. We need someone to speak the truth to us about who we are and about the situation that we're in. Because we deceive ourselves. We will lie to ourselves. Sometimes what we do is we will seek the counsel of others, but those that we know who will already affirm the position that we have. We have chosen this certain position, and we want others just to affirm it. We want others just to agree with us. Don't you think I should? What's wrong if I? And what we really want back from you is, yeah, that's it. That's exactly what I think. Or we seek no one else's counsel but our own. A man in my small group this week over lunch, he said to me, in a time of crisis, we all too often rely on ourselves. Far too often we rely on ourselves. No one can tell me what I should do. My heart tells me what is right. It's what I feel. I will feel what is right. The problem is, is our heart is deceitfully wicked. Thomas Cranmer, who edited the first two editions of the Book of Common Prayer used in the Anglican Church. Let me show you a picture of him. That dude is rocking a beard, isn't he? Man, love that beard. Here's what he said many years ago, but it's still true today. What the heart loves, the will chooses, and the mind justifies. What the heart loves, what we are passionate about, what we want to do, what we've convinced ourselves in our heart that we want to do, our will will choose and our mind will find the justification for it. Well, this is right for me. This feels good to me. Jeremiah says in chapter 17, verse 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Now, as a follower of Christ... As a follower of Christ, do we have a new heart and a new mind? Is it being spiritually transformed? Absolutely it is. Absolutely. The problem is it's not yet fully perfected. It won't be until we step into our eternity. We still have the ability to deceive ourselves, and we do. We seek to convince ourselves that what we want will work out. This decision is fine. This relationship is going to be fine. If we say we're followers of Christ, then shouldn't it be Christ that we seek? Even if what he says to us is hard and uncomfortable and inconvenient, even if what he says doesn't match our passions, our heart. The law, the instruction of God warns us that we cannot trust ourselves and that we will justify anything. And so we need a greater truth that we can turn to, that we can be settled in, that we can believe that this is what is good for us, and it's God's law. I have a friend of mine who's been wrestling with some pretty deep life issues. She made some decisions several years ago that she didn't take a lot of time to think about, And as she's been growing in her relationship with Jesus, she's beginning to wrestle with some of these life decisions. She's come to see me, and we've sat down a couple of times. And you know how it is. Tell me what to do. What should I do? And so I look at her and say, what does God say for you to do? Because you need to be convinced of it. We need to know that. We need to understand because we'll stand firmer if we've wrestled with it ourselves. What has God's word said to you? Where have you meditated on this? Where have you processed on this? 
And then she began to come to some good biblical conclusions about where she was in life, made some very hard decisions, life decisions. This week that she texted me, and I used this with her permission. She said, I finally got it, Jackson. We'll put it up here. I finally got it, Jackson. I'm free. In obeying Jesus and what he wanted for me, I feel freedom and peace like I've never known. I feel freedom and peace like I've never known. The freedom and the peace is in the yard. It's when we live under the control of God and God's instruction, when we live under his care, under his protection. This is where there's peace. This is where there's freedom. Not running down the driveway and out to another place thinking that's where we'll find it. Instead, there, there is no peace for us as followers of Christ. There's constantly this struggle of trying to make this thing work, trying to get settled with ourselves. Our heart wanted it, and we seek to justify it, and yet there is no peace for us. Blessed people know the favor of God because they seek the counsel of God. And blessed people bear spiritual fruit as a result of knowing the counsel of God, of meditating and delighting in his word. Look with me at verse 3. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The one who delights and meditates, prospers, spiritually flourishes. Now, look what David does. David, the author of this psalm, uses a picture from his culture that the people would have understand that would have read this poem. Let me show you a picture of the Judean wilderness. We'll look up here. This is where David, as a shepherd, spent his time. He knew this area very well. It is dry. It is barren. It is desert. But in the middle of this desert barren area, you see that little dark spot? That's an oasis. That's in Gedi. David would have gone there as a shepherd. David went there to hide from Saul. Let me show you a picture of what this looks like up close. Leave that up there for me for a second. What does David do? He paints a picture of what flourishing looks like in his world. It's a tree that is planted next to a stream where its roots can reach down and find nourishment from the soil and from the water. It's a tree that is green and has leaves. It's a tree that bears fruit in the midst of a barren world. Now, what does it mean to yield or bear fruit? What does that phrase mean? It means to have a God-honoring character that shows itself through our actions. To bear fruit is having a God-honoring character that shows itself through our actions. Let me show you a couple of verses around this. In John 15, 8, it says, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, so prove to be my disciples. That spiritual character is what reflects that we are gods, that we are connected to Jesus. We are being spiritually transformed in the character and likeness of Christ. We are thinking like him, and we're acting like him, and that identifies us as one of God's children. Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. In Philippians 1.11, it's the fruit of righteousness. This idea of fruit runs all through Scripture. This idea of bearing character, thinking differently, living differently because we've delighted in, we have meditated on the Word of God. We have processed it. We've applied it to our life, and we begin to look differently. How important is that for us today in the world in which we live in where it is hard to be a follower of Christ. We are constantly under attack, and it will get worse before it will get better. How important is it for us to delight in the law and meditate on the law and have our roots run deep so our connection to God is what we find our security in and our hope in? Look at that last phrase of verse 3. In all that he does, he prospers. There's a spiritual prospering, a spiritual thing that takes place. It's not a pledge of good fortune in return for good behavior, but it's instead a spiritual work that begins to take place in our life. I feel freedom and peace like I've never known, my friend said. Jesus puts it this way. In the last part of Matthew 7, 
Jesus tells a story. He says, there's these two guys that both want to build homes. One of them built his house upon a rock. And when it rains in the Judean hills far away, you might not even see the clouds. The water begins to gain and begins to rush in the, ga- in the gullies and can run down the hill and could crash up against your house. You didn't even know these flash floods that happened throughout Israel, especially in the south. But it hits his house, and because his house is built on a rock, his house stands. But this knucklehead, this knucklehead builds his house upon sand. Now, it seems hard because it's been beaten all day by the heat of the day, and so it seems like concrete, and so he thinks it's safe, and he builds his house on the sand. But that same flood that starts up in the hills begins to come down the gullies and hits his house and destroys his house. And then Jesus says, the man who hears my words and puts them into practice is the man who builds his house upon a rock, the one who obeys But the man who hears my word and does not put them into practice is the man who built his house upon the sand. They both hear. The key is the response. The key is the obedience. The fruitfulness of our life is known in our obedience. The prospering is known in our obedience. Will we choose to obey? In contrast to this one who bears fruit, look at verse 4. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Now, let me show you again a picture of chaff. And David uses something out of his culture. You would take wheat and you would run it over with heavy things and break it apart some from the kernel, from the covering from the outside. And then you would toss it in the air at a high point where there's wind. And the wind would blow it. And you can see in that picture the chaff is being blown, but the grain, the kernels are dropping down to his feet. He said, the wicked are like chaff. Instead of having roots that go deep, they're just blown everywhere. They have no roots. And again, here's the theme that you can chase through Scripture, that those who are wicked, those who are practical atheists, are blown about. You can really see the contrast of these two lives more vividly in verses 5 and 6 in the judgment. Look with me at verse 5. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. They will not stand in judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Look at that word knows in verse 6. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous. That word knows communicates an intimacy a connection, a deep relationship that God has with us. We read that, and it looks like he has that relationship with us because of our righteousness. And yet we know all too clearly God doesn't love us because of our righteousness. He loves us in spite that we're not righteous. Our righteousness comes as a response to being loved. Our obedience does not win us God's favor. The church is full of people who live thinking that I can earn God's favor and God's blessing if I live rightly, if I do rightly. And the question is that how much is enough? How do you know you've ever lived enough rightly? No, instead, that righteousness that we gain is not something that we earn or deserve, but it is something that has been given to us. It's an imputed righteousness to us. Go back again and look at verse 5. How are we able to stand in the place of judgment? We talked about this two weeks ago. We talked about it when we were looking at that psalm. We stand before God in judgment because we stand in one who has already been judged and found perfect. An imputed righteousness comes to us. It is given to us in Christ. Let me remind you of what Romans says. In Romans 5, 19, for as by the one man's disobedience, meaning Adam, the many were made sinners, so that by one man's obedience, Jesus, the many will be made righteous. It is the obedience of Christ. He's the one we read Psalm 1 and we go, that's Jesus. He is the one who delights in the law. He is the one who meditates on the law. He is the one who bears fruit. He is the one whose leaves never wither. He is the one who has deep roots. It is Jesus. Psalm 1 speaks of Jesus. And we experience this when we are connected to Christ, when his righteousness is given to us, imputed to us. I was 24 years old. I was newly married, and I had to have two nickels to rub together. A night out was us going to Taco Bell. 
And my father made possible for us to go to this really nice restaurant, uh, this, the, a chance for us to go first to Disneyland. I took a couple of my staff with me into this really cool restaurant at Disneyland, which I didn't even know existed. Let me show you a picture. It's called Club 33. Now, you have to be a member. You can't go. You just can't show up. You can't just call and make reservations. You've got to be a member. So my dad, because he was a member, got us in. I could show up. You kind of put, you push a button, and they go, yes, may I help you? And I go, Jackson Crum, and there's four of us. And they said, oh, Mr. Crum, please, come on up. And I go up, and they're in a tux, and, man, people are decked out. It's the best service I've ever seen. It's the best food that I've had. They even had matchbooks with my name printed on them on the table. I mean, this place was swanky. I'm not there because of me. I mean, I didn't deserve this. I hadn't earned it. I'm not a member. It's because of my dad's membership. It's because of my dad's reputation. It's because of what my dad had, that my dad gives it to me. I'm able to benefit and to enjoy because of what my father has given to me. That's exactly what happens for us. God gives us something that we have not earned, but that has been earned for us in Christ. And now when we look at verse 5, we are able to stand in the judgment because we have had that righteousness of Jesus. We are included in the congregation, not because of what we have done. We are included in the club because of what Jesus has done for us. And because of that relationship now, now we go to God and seek his counsel. Now we have this intimate relationship with him where he knows us and we know him. And we can call out to him and we say, we're struggling, this is hard, we're processing. How does this work out? And because of the relationship, our God answers. But some of us have not sought God and we have found ourselves in situations where we are like the man who built his house upon the sand. Life has hit us and has crushed us and we're limping. When my dog would come back, Dakota would come back and sit at the end of the driveway. He would howl. And then I would get up and I would go down. And I'd go out and I would unhook his collar and I'd walk him back in the yard and I'd hug him up and I'd put his collar back on and I would say, Dakota, this is where you need to be. Look at the yard. Go anywhere in the yard. This is where you're loved. This is where you're fed. Right here is where you need to be. Some of us are down at the foot of that driveway. And I want you to know that if you've made decisions where you have not sought God's counsel and you're limping and you're hurting, that God comes and takes you and brings you back in the yard, that God takes you and reminds you that he loves you, he delights in you. Do you live with some of the ramifications of your decision? Yeah, you do. But now you have a God who seeks to heal you, a God who seeks to help you, a God who wants to give you wisdom to navigate some of these decisions that you've made. He brings you back in the yard and says, here's the safety. Here's where you need to be. Let's bow our heads. There are some of us sitting here that recognize that we have made decisions that doesn't honor our God. And right here, right now, we need to confess that as we've talked about for many times over the last several weeks, and we need to repent. We need to agree with God with what we've done, and we need to turn from this and turn to Jesus. We will only know the invitation into the yard that is being extended when we confess. And some of us right here, right now, need to pray that prayer. God, I have sought other counsel. I have sought my own counsel. My heart has been deceived, and I have pursued things that don't honor you, and I want to come home. And I want to let you know again that your God walks down to the foot of the driveway and he walks you back into the yard. There are some of us sitting here, and we have made the right call. We have sought God. We have seen, heard his counsel, and we have made these decisions based on God's counsel. And yet life is still hard. It's been difficult. You need to be reminded and hear whispered in your ear, well done, good and faithful servant. 
and that you have a God who walks with you in your difficulty and at times will carry you, a God who is gracious to you and merciful to you, a God who continues to come along your side in these difficult moments. Father God, thank you that you have made a way for us to seek your face, to know you, that it's not a righteousness that we've had to earn, but a righteousness that has been given to us and has opened up the doorway that we might seek you, we might ask you, we might appeal to you, that we read your word and you are responsive to us. We praise you and thank you for this in Jesus' name.